Sounds good. Um, well, good morning, um, and and thanks for you know choosing to join this pod. I guess um, I'm I'm really excited to be here, as I mentioned, and you know the kind of culture and community that uh, you are all are building. You know, seems like it's at a really exciting uh, moment. Um, so for my part, I have been asked to share with you some of the legal rules that apply to philanthropic organizations, particularly around governance structures and the relative, uh, you know, the kind of regulatory guardrails that get applied um, under the law. And I'm pretty, uh, I think I'm uh, the right person to ask to do that. Um, so. Uh, as you can see from my slides, my name is Dana Brackman Reeser. Um, I teach at Brooklyn Law School, where I've been a member of the faculty for over 20 years. Um, and my research is on uh, nonprofit organizations, philanthropy, social enterprise, sustainable investing. I'm really interested in any of those um, situations where the boundary between for profit and not-for-profit um, activity or charitable and commercial activity, uh, kind of philanthropy and business where they overlap, right? Where the boundary gets blurry. Um, and so Sorry some to of interrupt. that research. Oh, yeah. Would you mind stopping your screen share and starting it again? I don't think <laughs> if we can see your slides at the moment. Oh, okay. Sure. Let's, let's do that. Um, are you getting the prompt from Chrome? There we go. So yeah, you got it? now you can continue. Perfect. Okay, thank you. I appreciate you letting me know. Um, so uh, that's kind of where I come at uh, all of these issues. And because I'm interested in that, in that boundary, I'm really interested in um, the literature and the rules around kind of what defines um, being a philanthropy, right? And kind of how you can structure philanthropic activity in different ways and why you would use different governance structures or apply different kinds of guardrails. Um, so uh, as I kind of explain the content of the uh, the kind of rules and the options that they make available, I'm gonna also try to explain the reasons behind those rules and guardrails, um, which will draw on a lot of this literature, including some of my own work. And I think that will inform um, some of the work that I understand you all want to do around kind of choosing what kind of governance structures and guardrails you want to apply in the um, organizations or, or structures or platforms that you're building. So. Uh, I'm going to try to walk through um, this content, but if there are questions, please do let me know. And um, uh, if anything is unclear, I'm happy to be interrupted. Um, my computer doesn't stop freezing. Okay, I think I got it now. So I'm going to move to the next slide. And get that to do. Hmm, Sorry. there seems to be a problem when you switch steps because the presentation just switched off again. Yeah, I don't know why it's doing that. Um, Maybe okay. that's because of the two screens? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know the answer. Sorry. So um, whenever that happens, I'll just let you know. Let, let's define an emoji just in case. <laughs> also, like a little sun emoji like this. OK. Right, and that so way I'm you'll gonna... know stop screen share and start it again just in case. OK. Sorry for the clunkiness that's going to introduce, but hopefully you no, um, can get to the content. Okay, so uh, can you see my slides again? Okay. Yep, that looks so, perfect. Great, so the first thing to notice here is the importance of form, um, legal form. And, and I'm using this idea in two ways. First is this basic divide between nonprofit and for-profit organizations um, <clears throat> that is established by the rule that nonprofit organizations are prohibited from distributing their profits to those who control them. Um, and this core idea of prohibition on distributing profits to those with control um, was um, uh, 
kind of described by um, Henry Hansman uh, in 1980 as the non-distribution constraint. And this is kind of like the fundamental core insight um, from economics and law about how we divide nonprofit and for-profit organizations. So despite their name, nonprofits can earn profits. There's no bar, there's no restriction on earning profits. The restriction is on distribution. And so what does that mean? It means that those profits can't be distributed to anyone who might have control of the organization, which includes uh, investors, right? So you can't have equity investors where shareholders or LLC members or partners who have a role in governance also have access to distributions of profits, either midstream, like with dividends or a draw or something like that, um, or distribution of residual assets on dissolution. So that's kind of the core um, distinction, right? That kind of um, uh, uh, crossroads, right? Where you have to choose if you're under the law, if you're going to set up an organization as a for-profit or a nonprofit, a nonprofit is going to have this basic uh, restriction, this bar on distribution. Of course, on the flip side, if you choose a for-profit, this does not uh, apply, right? There's you know, full access to distributions, and that's why people engage in a lot of for-profit activity, right, is the idea of earning, uh, the institution will earn profits, and those profits will be shared uh, with, the, uh, with those with control, including equity investors. Um, but it's important to note, right, that nonprofits are kind of highly identified with philanthropic activity, but for-profit entities too engage in all kinds of philanthropic activity, right? You, you only have to look, you know, at like corporate charitable contributions, right? To know that philanthropy is not the province solely of uh, nonprofit organizations. Of course, individuals um, also play this role. So if you're thinking about setting up an organization to engage in philanthropy, the first choice you have to make is are you gonna use a nonprofit or a for-profit form? Um, the other sense in which I'm using this idea of legal form is to think about um, how legal form uh, is also a choice among options within those nonprofit and for-profit categories, right? There are a variety of types of nonprofit organizations and for-profit organizations that have somewhat different governance rules as well, um, and those can also be uh, instructive. So I'm going to try to uh, advance this and hopefully not lose my slides. Let's see what happens. Did that work? Okay, great. So um, this is just some basics on legal forms for philanthropic activity. Um, and uh, many of you I'm sure are familiar with most of the options on the for-profit side, um, which all offer uh, different uh, kind of baskets of value to folks who organize and participate in them. Uh, so a for-profit corporation uh, is uh, going to give limited liability to investors as shareholders. They are not going to be liable for the debts of the corporation. Um, there are also, however, tax rules that are highly important here, and we're going to talk a lot about tax rules today. And corporations are taxable entities, as I'm sure uh, most of you know, this can lead to a double taxation when the corporation is taxed on profit it earns and then passes um, uh, profits on to uh, its investors who are taxed as well. Partnerships, uh, of course, avoid this uh, negative tax uh, situation uh, because they're treated as pass-through entities. The entities themselves are not taxable, um, but when profits uh, flow through to the partners, they are going to be taxed. Um, so that's a positive for any form of partnership, but it also means when you set up as a partnership that at least some of the partners are going to sacrifice limited liability and will be potentially liable for the debts of the entity. And so that's relatively undesirable, right? Um, and the LLC, one of the you know great uh, kind of legal inventions in the business organizations area is the limited liability company, which offers both desirable features, right? Limited liability for investors, um, the kind of analog of shareholders who are called members, and pass-through treatment uh, under the tax code is also available so you can avoid that double taxation issue. 
right? Um, <clears throat> so uh, I'm sure those are uh, relatively familiar to many of you, but maybe the nonprofit legal options for form of organization are less familiar. There's also a corporate form, the nonprofit corporation. It looks a lot like a for-profit corporation. It has a board of directors, um, uh, it has uh, meetings at various times. Uh, it uh, is in many ways similar, but because of that non-distribution constraint, it's not going to have shareholders, right? Um, and a nonprofit uh, corporation can identify a group of members who will play shareholder roles in governance. Um, so they can elect directors or vote on things like mergers, but they won't receive profit distributions, of course. But most nonprofit corporations don't actually make that choice to create a membership um, category. And instead, they really have their boards as their only governance actors. And so this might be of interest to you, I think, right? Thinking about whether you want to have some kind of um, uh, representative function where a group uh, that might be, uh, you know, somehow an analog to shareholders or members would be electing directors, voting on fundamental transactions like mergers or um, uh, dissolutions, whatever the analogs would be for that. Um, <clears throat> or if you want to have just kind of one body, right? Um, as most nonprofit corporations do, they have a self-perpetuating board that, uh, named their own successors, uh, and they're the only kind of real set of actors in uh, in internal governance. Um, <clears throat> charitable trusts, which is another uh, form of organization for nonprofit entities, are even uh, have the capacity to be even more narrowly governed. They can have a single trustee who is in charge of um, all the actions of the charitable trust. Um, they are. Uh, uh, subject to challenge, right? They are uh, treated as a fiduciary under the law, so uh, their actions can be challenged if they are disloyal uh, or fair, fail to act prudently. Um, but there's not a lot of uh, folks who have standing to bring those challenges. It's generally limited to the attorney general of the state. So if you were going to think about using the charitable trust as a model, it would um, really let a lot of power reside in a single person, potentially in that single trustee or in a group of trustees, which could be quite small. One um, really important thing to keep in mind is kind of how to how big to make that group um, and uh, what number of uh, folks who are going to make decisions you uh, envision. You want to think about the possibility for ties always, and even numbers of trustees and directors are always a bad idea. Um, but you also want to think about, you know, how many folks are going to be able to really govern a particular organization and um, how much dialogue you're anticipating versus how much kind of more command and control type um, operations. There's also an unincorporated nonprofit association, um, which uh, is really only used by very small or embryonic organizations and does not offer limited liability. So um, that is uh, probably not a great um, kind of analog for you. I think we can leave those aside. All of these uh, nonprofit entities, whether they're nonprofit corporations or charitable trusts or even unincorporated nonprofit associations are eligible to qualify as tax exempt under federal law and their donors are eligible to deduct their contributions to these organizations under federal income and transfer taxes if they uh, the organization is qualified as tax exempt. It's not automatic from being one of these organizational types, but it is necessary, if not sufficient. Um, and none of the for-profit forms, importantly, offer those benefits, right? Um, and so this is one reason kind of the pull, the incentive that's provided by tax law is one reason why tax law's guardrails for philanthropy are kind of such an important model, I think, for you all to consider. So I'm trying to move on. Okay. So I want to talk some more about what makes nonprofit governance different and kind of really go back and, and drill down a little bit into the non-distribution constraint and why it uh, exists, right? Why nonprofit organizations are characterized by this non-distribution constraint, which really is the way to differentiate them from for-profits. Um, and 
So it's worth unpacking the reasons that, um, that the literature offers for kind of why the non-distribution constraint is valuable. And the first um, pioneered by Weisbrod is this idea that they enable the provision of public goods. Right. So this goes back to an economic distinction between private goods and public goods, um, which, again, you may be familiar with already. Um, but private goods right, are like the ordinary types of goods you, uh, you know, trade in uh, in real life marketplaces. Um, and the private market does a pretty good job of producing them. So right now, as maybe you can see, I'm in the Adirondack Mountains. And so a lot of maple syrup is available for sale. It's a really common private good that uh, you see a lot of around these parts. And it's a classic private good. And the private market is doing a perfectly good job of providing as much maple syrup as anyone could possibly want to buy. Um, and we don't need any kind of nonprofit provision or government provision as an alternative. Um, but public goods are ones that the private market will underproduce because you can't really match up the um, consumers who might buy the good with the producers' uh, needs for funding uh, because people won't really be persuaded to contribute to pay enough to produce public goods. And the reasons for that are that public goods are, number one, non-exclusionary, and number two, non-rival. And just to, you know, unpack that a little bit, um, can think about another uh, good that's in plentiful supply in the Adirondacks, which is clean air, right? And so clean air is a very desirable good, but it's not exclusionary, right? Once you produce clean air for me, you can't uh, restrict other folks who are enjoying the Adirondack Mountains from enjoying that clean air as well. Um, and uh, so you can't limit the uh, the, you know, kind of spoils of the production of it only to those who contribute to that production process. Um, so that's non-exclusionary. They're also non-rival, right? Making this good for me, clean air, doesn't make there less available for you, right? And um, there's clean air for everyone if you make it, and there's not for everyone if you don't, right? And so the classic response to the problem that the private market, you know, this kind of market failure where the private market will underproduce public goods is government, right? Well, who's in charge of clean air? It's the government, right? They impose the regulations and uh, the requirements, and they can do that because they have the power of fiat, right? They can impose taxation to um, get the funds and no one has to be persuaded. They can just be compelled to pay in their share. Uh, and they also, uh, uh, you know, can just require actions to be taken. Um, but the problem is uh, government will also be subject to some failures because it will not produce optimal quantities of all public goods, right? Especially when government is going to be responsive to political realities, right? And uh, that might be the democratic process, that might be the influence of in interest groups, uh, in other countries, it might be authoritarian um, I, I, governments and, and how, you know, they're incentivized. So government is going to produce some public goods, but not necessarily an optimal quantity of all public goods. And nonprofit firms here come in and play an important role because um, they, too, like government, can uh, get people to pay for the provision of public goods. And the argument that Weisbrod uh, kind of pioneered is that the non-distribution constraint is what lets them do this because the non-distribution constraint lets those who would contribute toward the production of these public goods trust that those running the nonprofit will not skim off resources to line their own pockets, will not skimp on quality uh, because they uh, want to take the additional you know, savings for their own uh, uses, the non-distribution constraint prevents them from doing so, so we can trust nonprofits to provide public goods, right? So that's one argument for why the non-distribution constraint is valuable. And as you can see, it's really focused on this idea of trust. Another argument for why we see nonprofit uh, production is provided or was originated with, again, Henry Hansman, who gave us that non-distribution constraint language. Um, and Hansman points not to public goods, 
but instead to contract failure, as he calls it, right? So he says it's not a market failure like the public goods problem or government failure, it's a contract failure. Um, in, in at least some cases, right? And these explanations for nonprofit production can um, coexist. They're not, uh, you know, each one does not necessarily um, explain all nonprofit production. But so here, contract failure, this invite says, well, um, the private market also underproduces uh, public, uh, private goods, not just public goods, but it under underproduces private goods when quality of those goods is difficult to police. Right. And so, um, again, you're going to have this uh, problem with private production where consumers have a problem trusting the producers. Right. And, and you can see nonprofit production being really valuable here as well, because and you can match up right the kind of things you see nonprofits doing in lots of ways um, with this account. Right. So think about um, healthcare or education, you know, huge nonprofit uh, production fields where it's uh, sometimes the purchasers are not the recipients of the goods or services, right? Like I pay for my daughter's education, but I am not the one in the classroom. So I have a harder time judging quality um, or healthcare where you sometimes have third party payers, but also it can just be difficult as a non-expert to judge quality. Right, but also philanthropic activity, right? Like think about disaster relief, right? If I am buying disaster relief in Ukraine, right? Well, it's gonna be pretty hard for me to tell if that's actually happening when I send my dollars to the organization that purports to be providing that relief. And so again, the non-distribution constraint, which kind of walls off the possibility that those running the firm will be skimming off resources to line their own pockets or skimping on quality is a reassurance, right? That allows purchasers to uh, trust, right? That they can buy these goods where they'll have a difficult um, problem using ordinary contracting, right? Where they can, uh, you know, kind of look at the quality and challenge the quality if uh, it's not produced or if even no uh, disaster relief might be produced at all, um, when that ability to use contracting to effectuate um, your goals in the private market, nonprofit production with the non-distribution constraint adds that additional trust and uh, can be helpful. So these are some ways that the non-distribution constraint plays a really important signaling role, right, to denote trustworthy firms. Um, and some of the work that I've been doing kind of really um, focuses in on that idea of how the non-distribution constraint acts as a signal to differentiate uh, trustworthy firms, not only for donors, uh, but also to other kinds of stakeholders, employees who might be willing to uh, work on philanthropic projects for um, uh, less compensation, right? Um, customers or beneficiaries who need to identify uh, the proper or trustworthy source for the uh, products or benefits that they're seeking. And then even to regulators, right, who can target incentives um, toward uh, pro-social activity. Um, <clears throat> like the tax law uh, often plays this role as we'll get to in a moment. So by marking this kind of sharp differentiation between the for-profit and non-profit sectors, I see the non-distribution playing you know, a potentially really valuable role but that sharpness is really being blurred, right, by innovations that are pushing um, all kinds of pro-social activity, but today we'll focus on philanthropic activity kind of across that nonprofit for profit divide. Um, and so that's what a lot of my research is investigating and some of which I'll talk about shortly. Okay, so, um, we're gonna to have to talk about tax. Uh, I think that's uh, our next stop. Uh, let's see if I can get it to click, right. Um, <clears throat> so there are also some really important categories in the tax area. And once you decide to operate a philanthropic uh, institution as a nonprofit entity, probably because you want the values that um, come along with access to tax benefits, you have to also 
um, be kind of sorted, right, into a category within tax exempt entities, right? So most kind of lay people un, uh, have familiarity with like a 501c3 tax exempt organization, right? You see that on lots of solicitations that you might receive. We're a 501 tax, 501c3 tax exempt organization. But there are actually more than, there are actually two really important categories within that designation um, that are really important when you're thinking about philanthropy. And those are a public charity and a private foundation. So in addition to thinking about when you're um, kind of planning philanthropic activity, in addition to thinking about well, should I be a nonprofit or a for-profit? Even if you decide you want to be a nonprofit, probably because you, you know, want to use the, the value of the non-distribution constraint, including the value that it gives you access to tax advantages, then you're also going to have to choose which tax category you're going to fall into. And it's not necessarily, you know, totally optional because the structure of the organization and kind of the, um, uh, the way that it funds itself and is going to operate is really going to sort you into one of these two categories. Um, so you're either going to end up going in one direction or the other, either a public charity or a private foundation. So I'm just going to tell you a little bit about those two categories, and then we'll talk more about oops, um, about uh, why this, you know, kind of how this maps on to philanthropic activity. So if you're thinking about uh, public charities, right? Public charities um, are, if you're engaging in philanthropic activity as your main activity, it's going to be pretty hard to be set up as a public charity um, because a public charity requires um, <clears throat> you to be uh, uh, kind of either generating support from many small donors or engaging in operations that will generate revenues. Right. And if what you're imagining, uh, you know, kind of as a philanthropic activity is uh, a small group of large donors uh, or uh, which is primarily going to engage in philanthropy, right, giving money to others, right, giving money to those operating charities, you're probably not going to fit this um, requirement to demonstrate broad public support. But you might want to try because public charities get the best tax advantages. They get full entity level tax exemption. 100% of the uh, income from whatever source derived is exempt from federal income tax. Um, and they also offer the best income tax deductibility for donors. There are a variety of restrictions on um, how much uh, deductibility donors get in certain different circumstances. And all the rules prefer public charities. Right, so you get the ability to deduct, deduct more for both an individual um, uh, uh, donation and also kind of as a total percent of your income. And the regulation is also lighter for public charities, right? So they are subject to some limits on kind of how commercial they can be, and they're required to have this nonprofit purpose, um, but they have um, lesser. Uh, disclosure requirements, right? So you may be aware if you want to look up information about any 501c3 tax exempt organization, you can uh, get access as a member of the public to their annual disclosures that they provide to the IRS. Um, but those disclosures for public charities will not include information about donors. And um, so there's disclosure, but it's not as much disclosure. So that's public charities. And uh, typically, uh, you know, if they can, organizations are, uh, philanthropic organizations are going to prefer uh, those, that kind of better set of, uh, uh, of options. That said, the option, the, the advantages for private foundations are also pretty good, right? And they are going to lack those indications of public support. They're probably going to have a small number of large donor, a limited number of direct charitable activities, and uh, instead be earning their income on investments, right? They're going to be a pool of assets that's dedicated to philanthropy. Um, so there are reduced tax advantages, but they're not so bad, right? The uh, small tax on investment income is currently set at 1.39%. That's a pretty good tax rate as tax rates go. It's not zero, it's not negative, but uh, it's much lower than your standard corporate tax rate. Um, and uh, they also do still offer deductibility for donors. The income tax uh, deductibility is, as I say, somewhat lesser than for donations to a public charity, um, but they still have deductible 
contributions to a considerable extent uh, in terms of income tax and estate and gift tax uh, exemption is still uh, available at the same level as a public charity, which can be really important when um, funding philanthropic activity with um, uh, transfers of assets, especially at death. The big difference here is around regulation. Um, and this is, I think, what's really important to convey to you because these regulations set up some real guardrails that are that are um, that were created with the intention to really channel philanthropic activity in a way that would mesh with so societal goals um, as opposed to potentially simply magnify the influence of already wealthy and elite individuals. Um, so I think those are going to be really interesting um, for you guys to think about what are those guardrails, uh, those regulatory burdens, and we'll talk more about them. Um, and uh, they also have uh, greater public disclosure, including disclosure of donors. So I think that disclosure piece is interesting for you guys to think about kind of how transparent um, you want to set up the what, whatever you set up to be um, that there, you know, transparency, you know, comes in different kinds of variations. Um, and the expectations in the philanthropic world are are somewhat varied, right, in terms of what level of transparency is going to be expected. Dana, and yeah. we've got a question coming in. Would you want to answer sure. it right now or should we wait? Sure, I can finish? answer. So excellent. Rafa, feel free to pop in and ask the question. Or if not, I can ask it for you. So Rafa asks, well, oh, seems like he's popping okay. in. Let's just give it a second. There we go. Rafa, feel free to unmute and ask the question. Oh, there we go. Uh, that, my GIF looks really funny. Um, <laughs> so so I, I had a question with regards to kind of, you know, thinking about like private foundation versus, uh, so you mentioned that there are two different types of nonprofits. There was like the private foundation, and then there was one other one, which I forgot the name for. Public um, charities, those are tax exempt. And what was yeah. the other one, sorry? public charities and the public charity. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so one of the things that I thought was interesting is that there's, there's three kind of like components to it. There's like the regulation, there's like the benefits that you receive, and then there's mm -hmm. kind of like governance requirements as a mm -hmm. result of that. Um, mm -hmm. So kind of like what the government does, what the benefits that we receive are um, as an entity, and then what things we need to do uh, to maintain compliance and eligibility right. for um, with with regards to those regulations, I was wondering if you could talk through a little bit of um, where are the hard restrictions with regards to those activities. So mm -hmm. I one example. So I, for context, I do run a nonprofit myself, but I'm curious mm -hmm. uh, from your perspective that there is like it's not just you can't distribute profits. But there is also one of the things that I heard was like you have to have a board of governors um, or a, a, a board, an oversight board. And um, you, ha you mentioned that you have limitations on commercial activities. Mm -hmm. um, you have other requirements like you, you have to have a set of bylaws um, that, that they kind of like differ from a corporation. So I was wondering if you could talk through a couple of those. Sure. Um, so most of the rules that you are referencing really come from, uh, they're not, they're not um, articulated in the tax law specifically uh, for mm -hmm. public charities versus private foundations. Um, what, what you see is a kind of incorporation by reference, right? Because you have to be either a nonprofit corporation or a charitable trust or an unincorporated nonprofit association in order to qualify as a 501c3 public charity or private foundation, the kind of governance rules from those uh, legal forms get incorporated into the tax Oh, law. interesting. So it's, uh, so it's actually not a direct requirement. It's kind of like, this is, okay, that's- It's like folded in, 
right? So yeah. because a nonprofit corporation has to have a board of directors, it, you know, and a charitable trust has to have at least one trustee and an unincorporated association also has to have a board, right? And those are your only three options for form if you want tax exemption, then you have to have one of those governance mechanisms in place to get tax exemption. Got it. And, and okay, that's interesting. So, okay. Because one of the things that I find quite curious is that the, you know, some of the pattern of governance, like emergence that's happening is like mixing, like all these different entities and like being some of them. Um, and I wonder, um, I wonder what it will converge to. And it would be, it would be funny if, if a lot of the digital communities actually converge into uh, potentially a form that already exists. Um, but um, uh, it's a, it's quite interesting to that. Okay, that explains yeah, a lot. I would be really interested to see that too as it, as it develops. Um, okay, so let me tell you a little bit more about these guardrails. And I think that was also another part of your question about kind of what are the hard rules that are applied by tax law. Um, and so to do that, you have to go back in time just a little bit to understand kind of when this, this happened. And it was really um, uh, the, the rules that we have in place for setup over 50 years ago in 1969, um, but they were actually responding to a long history of concern about the kind of amalgamation of power in philanthropic institutions as wealth got more and more concentrated in the US um, throughout the 20th century. And um, so kind of robber barons time, uh, you know, late 1900s, early, uh, uh, sorry, late 1800s, early 1900s, um, you see fortunes balloon, you see industrialists uh, begin to think about organizing philanthropy along the same lines that they organize their uh, massive uh, for-profit activities, um, including the idea of setting up not a tax category at this time, but the idea of a foundation, um, which um, was pioneered by folks like Rockefeller, who really wanted to organize their philanthropy rather than like receiving a million letters from people, will you sponsor my this or that? They wanted to set up an organization that was going to manage their philanthropic activities. And so they needed to go and you know set up one of these legal forms. And at the time to do that, you had to get permission from a particular jurisdiction, whether that be a state or the federal government to charter uh, an, an, an organization like a foundation. And Rockefeller, because he you know, sees himself as a really important fellow, right, goes to Congress and wants a federal charter for his foundation, which he you know, uh, intends to have national, if not international kind of aspirations. And kind of a shock, I think, today to think about, but Congress refused to give him the charter for the philanthropic foundation because they were so worried about how it was going to magnify his already huge influence on the economy and the society. They didn't want to kind of cede to private philanthropy um, the social agenda, right? And uh, so they refused to, to offer his charter and he really tried you know, to kind of make them happy. He offered all kinds of kind of governance um, proposals that seem shocking today like he said well we'll let the the chief justice of the supreme court always have a seat on the board of my foundation right so think about that kind of government involvement and in in philanthropy today would be really shocking right but he was trying to get the um the charter approved at the national level and um, and ultimately congress refused to do so uh, and you know in the end he was able to get the state of new york to give him a charter so the rockefeller foundation was created um but it just gives you a sense of kind of how this suspicion um, of uh, wealth and influence really affected um, uh, regulation of philanthropy. And that continued in different um, forms. We see it during the Red Scare, we see it during the Civil Rights Movement, um, where there was this suspicion around um, uh, philanthropic activity being able to magnify the influence of elites. And this all culminates in 1969, when as part of a tax reform act, um, there is enacted a series of regulations that creates this tax category of private foundations that gets special and more intense regulation and uh, somewhat lesser tax benefits. Um, and I envision this idea of the 1969 tax reform, I envision it as a really a bargain, right? This grand bargain between philanthropists who uh, want to engage in this kind of activity and have this imprimatur of government for it, um, and uh, between government who's concerned about how this is going to magnify influence. And so what they do is they 
um, in these, uh, through these regulations, they preserve the ability for foundations to last perpetually. And this is another kind of design feature you might be thinking about. Um, there's, uh, there still is a lot of critical commentary about perpetual uh, philanthrop philanthropic organizations concerned that they should have a sunset. Um, and that was seriously considered as part of these 1969 um, discussions, but was rejected. Uh, and they preserve uh, perpetuity as an option. Um, they preserve autonomy, right? We don't have the Supreme Court justice, right? Serving on the board of the foundations um, <clears throat> and relatively generous tax treatment. But as I've said, not as generous as you get for a, um, <clears throat> uh, for a public charity. Um, and then they impose these three types of regulations, right? A variety of guardrails around how the largesse of these philanthropists will be targeted, right? What's gonna qualify as an appropriate distribution by a tax benefited private foundation, right? One of the one uh, one of the features you might be familiar with here is a walling off of political activity, right? So philanthropic organizations are not allowed to engage in political activity. Private foundations are completely barred from any kind of lobbying activity, any political campaign activity, even most voter registration activity is outside of what they can direct their um, uh, their philanthropic uh, uh, funds to, right? Um, also, uh, they were quite worried about kind of self-dealing transactions um, and other uh, kinds of uh, situations where uh, the, the benefits really of philanthropy would uh, be uh, redounding not to society, but to the private, right, kind of um, uh, advantage of uh, the philanthropist himself, it was himself at the time. Um, <clears throat> and you also see restrictions around timing, right? There was a real concern that these foundations would be just warehouses for wealth, right? You would just kind of put the money in, but nobody would ever get it, right? Um, and it would have all these tax benefits when it went in, and then it would never actually go out to benefit society. So um, this payout requirement that you may have heard about, foundations are required to pay out 5% of their assets every year in uh, distributions to uh, uh, primarily to operating charities. Um, so that's all about kind of pushing out the benefit of philanthropic activity and not having it kind of um, be hoarded. Um, and then transparency, right, which I've talked about a little bit already, these disclosure obligations um, <clears throat> uh, that are most heavy on foundations, including the disclosure of donor names. Although it's unclear, there was a Supreme Court decision in 2021 that cast some doubt on whether those, those uh, donor um, transparency rules will survive First Amendment scrutiny in the current Supreme Court, and they may be challenged in the next few years. But all of these, uh, all of these uh, private foundation rules, right, the targeting, the timing, the transparency, they're all about trying to cabin the ability of foundation founders, philanthropists, from using their philanthropy to magnify their own societal power, right? That's really the, the core idea here. But we now, you know, go ahead 50 years, right? We've got folks who are opting out of this system, right? So interesting for you, I'm sure, to learn about all of these different options that are, uh, you know, kind of enshrined in the law. But you also need to know that lots of philanthropists today are opting out of these systems. They're doing quite different things. Um, and, I, and so I think that's also pretty relevant for your kind of design um, task, right? So the biggest leap is when folks are opting out of nonprofit forms altogether, right? Avoiding getting rid of that non-distribution constraint, as well as the tax rules, right? This is going to give philanthropic donors the greatest flexibility, the greatest control, right? None of those requirements apply. It also gives them the most privacy, right? Because the transparency requirements won't apply. So it can be very, uh, very enticing. And a lot of the tax disadvantages that you would think would come with opting out of a nonprofit form can actually be mitigated with some advanced planning. Um, and uh, to the extent that a philanthropist chooses, they can also add back in privately, right? Their own restrictions on distributions, their own targeting rules, timing commitments, um, or transparency commitments. They can make those decisions kind of one-off, right? Maybe in the way that Rafa was describing, right? You kind of pick and choose. And I think a really nice example here 
is the Philanthropy LLC. So you may be familiar or heard about the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative, um, which is uh, founded by Priscilla Chan and Mark Zuckerberg uh, to advance human potential and promote equality for all children in the next generation, pretty big aspiration. Um, but it is formed as an LLC right, a for-profit entity. So no non-distribution constraint. If they change their mind and they think there's some other way to advance human potential for promoting all children or whatever, right, or they just want to do something else with their money, they can take it back out, right? They can uh, take it back out and do something else with it. Now, there'll be reputational costs, obviously, for doing it, but there's no legal restriction. Um, also gets rid of those targeting limits, right? So they can use the assets of the LLC for political advocacy, which might be quite important in advancing human potential, right? Or promoting equality for children. Um, so uh, they also can make those individualized choices, right? About transparency. And over time, since it was found in 2015, they have put on their website more and more transparency around the funding that they provide uh, at least to nonprofits, less transparency around the impact investments they make in for-profit entities, and even less about advocacy, right? So they're making those transparency decisions one at a time. So that's an example of opting out of nonprofit form altogether. Um, you can also just opt out of foundation status, right? That's another possibility, right? Get into that uh, public charity category where you have more flexibility, um, more privacy, and better tax advantages, right? Um, and so if you can avoid the foundation rules but maintain the non-distribution constraint, um, donors might have, you know, a more desirable set of uh, costs and benefits. Um, and again, they can kind of add back in what they wish. And here I think the, the example for, um, for you guys to kind of have in mind is the donor-advised fund. Um, and so the donor advised fund, and, and I understand that there uh, is even a donor advised fund operating already in the crypto space, at least one. Um, what they do is a donor makes a contribution to a sponsor of donor advised funds, which is an organization that qualifies as a public charity. And then once the donation is made, those assets are legally the property of the sponsoring public charity. So the donor can't get them back, right? Non-distribution constraint. Um, but the donor can give advice on how and when to distribute those assets. And that advice is typically followed, especially by the largest donor advised funds, uh, which today are affiliated with investment companies like um, Fidelity, Vanguard, on the higher end, Goldman Sachs. Um, <clears throat> Uh, the donor uh, is empowered to give advice and the sponsor uh, takes kind of a management fee, right, while the assets are, uh, you know, remaining in the sponsor organization, um, but doesn't take any of the assets uh, otherwise for itself and uh, follows the donor's instructions about how to distribute. In terms of transparency, the sponsor is required as a public charity, right, to, um, to post that, uh, that, disclosure document, right, but it doesn't have uh, fund by fund disclosures. So it gives a lot more privacy to donors, right? So you can figure out what uh, charities the Fidelity Charitable Fund gave to, but you aren't necessarily going to know which of its donors, right, uh, selected that particular charity. And the next slide just gives you some more detail about um, how big these uh, these are getting uh, and uh, kind of their influence so much so that they've attracted some regulatory attention, uh, including this Accelerate Charitable Efforts Act, which is currently before Congress, has bipartisan sponsorship, but who knows where, whether it'll go anywhere. Um, but what it really does is it tries to target um, uh, private foundations to some degree, but as well donor advised funds to make them more like private foundations, to impose timing requirements. So donor advised funds, the donor can't just put their uh, donation into the fund, take the tax deduction when they do so, and then let the funds languish, right? But force those funds out into society. Um, uh, also kind of limiting the advantages uh, that donors get uh, if they wait too long to make those distributions, right? So reincorporating some of those goals that we saw in the grand bargain, um, uh, applying them to these non-foundation uh, uh, or foundation substitutes donor advised funds.
so that's one kind of potential response that you can think about um, that's kind of on the horizon, in addition to private ordering that I mentioned, right, where prudentially individual donors can kind of add back in some of these components. Um, and then there's also, right, the big ticket systemic reforms, right, things like if there's a wealth tax, right, the big corporate um, tax change that was just passed um, and signed by President Biden, right, all of those kind of systemic reforms that affect the tax system also are going to have impacts on philanthropy and how those guardrails are um, kind of how, uh, how high they are, right? And how easy they are to avoid. Um, so I'm gonna stop there and uh, hopefully there are some other questions. Um, and I'd be happy to say more about some of these examples, but I just wanted to kind of put them before you so you can see folks are already doing that mixing and matching. Um, Excellent. Well, you can go right ahead. Yeah. So, uh, so question: when when people are not using the normal entities, but are using these like uh, additional ones that you that mm -hmm. you explain, um, and I can see the tax advantage from the individual, especially if you have either a single or a series of large donors mm -hmm. uh, that kind of like accrue those tax benefits in that same year and also over like uh, continuous years. Um, mm -hmm. What about the, are, are there any, but because you're not one of the other entities, um, are they still like a 501c3 or are they, or are they uh, a different commercial entity and still owe like normal corporate taxes? So two different answers for the two examples I gave you, right? So um, a, a philanthropy LLC, like the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative yeah. is a fully taxable entity. Okay. Right? So if it earns investment income, it's going to be taxed on that income, yeah. but it also might have losses, right? Because it might be investing in, you That's know, right. like yeah. social enterprises and making impact investments, right? So it may not have a lot of taxable income. Um, it's making all these distributions, right? Um, so uh, unclear how much income it's going to have, but it's a fully taxable entity. Um, yeah. The something like the Vanguard Charitable Fund, right, is a public charity. So it is a it is a tax exempt 501c3 entity. As an entity, it owes no tax. Okay. It's a, it's a nonprofit form, right? So you can, so it's kind of halfway, right? So the LLC really gets rid of all of this apparatus, right? It's not a nonprofit yeah. and it doesn't qualify for these tax categories, either one of them, right? Whereas the donor advice fund is really, staying a nonprofit, keeping that non-distribution constraint, right? But, um, you know, finding a way to get into the more favorable tax category of the yeah. public charity. And if you were to uh, fast forward, you know, 10 years and you, you think about the projection of these entities, do you see uh, an uh, adoption of these new forms as a more regular um, entity option? So, for example, the the Chan Zuckerberg Foundation mm -hmm. the, and, and the, the DAF, I think? Um, or do you see new forms or new experimental forms um, uh, emerge? Like, uh, have you seen some other types of entities that you think will, um, will be more common? Yeah, I mean, I think what you said about mixing and matching is very prescient. I think what, um, you know, if we're talking about smaller individual donors, I think the DAF will continue to grow because it just, you know, gives so many advantages to donors and it's so regulatorily enabled, unless something like the ACE Act applies, right? Which, you know, if that gets passed, that could really put a damper because it, you know, takes away some of those benefits. So um, uh, I'm, I'm not, I don't think the ACE Act is going to pass this session, but it's something that, you know, continues to come up, right? It took 40 years for the 69 Act to, to, to come together. I think that DAF regulation will come on board at some point, but I don't necessarily think in its current form that statute will um, be enacted, but maybe, you know, I'm not, that's not my political prognostication is not my forte. Um, but what I do see with kind of bigger donors, right? So particularly the high net worth individuals, um, what I see, um, is a, a real proliferation of using the LLC form as a coordinating entity, right? Um, so it's, uh, you can kind of have a foundation, you can have a, um, a donor advice fund and you can coordinate it all through the LLC so that you can also do all the things you can't do in either of those forms, right? At the LLC level, um, almost operating like a philanthropic family office, 
And that's, that's where I think I see the kind of high net worth individuals going. And I also have a kind of a stream of research around corporate philanthropy, which is very similar, where some are just closing their foundations and moving all of their philanthropy into the for-profit corporation, but more are just kind of picking and choosing, right? And doing some uh, of their philanthropic activity when it works through a foundation or even through a donor advised fund, and then doing other kinds of philanthropic activity that they want to keep private or that doesn't fit within these guardrails, doing them within the for-profit corporation itself. Yeah, interesting. Yeah, I, I also, the other thing that kind of like reminds me is that um, especially like digitally as these entities become more accessible to individuals, um, I can definitely see an increase in a, in kind of like adoption of both like different governance processes and like different coordination mechanisms. So like, you know, Kiran, myself, like if we have like a small group of people and we're like passionate about a project, it would be more beneficial for us to actually spin up an entity and then invest our money together in that entity than it would be for each of us to like execute it of individually. Course. Right. So that it's kind of- And then you have to think about how you set that entity up, right? Yeah, yeah. It makes me wonder where like some of the innovation that we can see is that if we do have smart contracts, which mimic the same type of like entity structures and boundaries, mm -hmm. yeah. um, and you can automatically deploy them from like a factory, um, then it, it, you know, we have, I, I don't know how familiar you are with DAOs, but being able to spin up a, a right. multi -seg, I wonder if, if in a decade we'll be able to spin up an LLC in the same kind of like breath um, yeah. uh, and have, for example, automated like delegate systems or board of advisors, which are like some sort of like um, agent or, or delegate that exists. So it's quite, quite interesting to see that as like a, um, a more accessible piece, just because I can I can see smart con smart contract evolution, um, it, you know, developing faster than regulation can. Absolutely. So, <laughs> and so, so you could do a lot of that trial and error, right, in this space, yeah. and then you might see that get ported over into the regulatory yeah. space too. One question for you: If uh, hypothetically, if uh, a thought experiment, if we were to have um, you know, a piece of code which mimic this type of regulation. So had bylaws mm -hmm. embedded in it, um, you know, had signature requirements and, and so on and so forth, uh, potentially some privacy data, but proof of that, uh, of that data uh, and those credentials in place. Do you think that would be recognized as an entity by the government if it was like in code? And that's a bigger question than a philanthropic question, I would say. Yeah. You know, I, I, I would guess that any recognition there um, of kind of philanthropic activities operating that way would lag recognition of those kinds of structures in other fields, just because, you know, typically business regulation comes first, you know, yeah. philanthropy regulation comes later. Um, so I wouldn't imagine, you know, this is where you would see the first acceptance of that kind yeah. of digital organization. Um, but, but there's a lot of, you know, as even your first question, um, you know, my answer to your first question reflected, there's a lot of this kind of, um, you know, relying on other regulation that gets ported into philanthropy regulations. So, you know, if, you know, you can set up as a nonprofit corporation and some state allows a nonprofit corporation to be, you know, just one of these sets of code, then, you know, by kind of, incorporation by reference it would then be acceptable under the under the tax law yeah we should i should do a phd and just like do the code and submit it for application and see like see if it would get accepted and be a fun project um <laughs> thank you so much uh for for your expertise and your yeah, time thank you for your questions